Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Christine Gould, and I'm from Gynecology Associates of Gwinnett in Lawrenceville, Georgia. So, um, July is Fibroid Awareness Month, so I am here with Dr. John Littman, who's an interventional radiologist, hello, at the Atlanta Fibroid Center. So we are here to talk about fibroids and how we can treat them. Okay, so what are fibroids? Fibroids are also known as leiomyomas or myomas. They're the most common pelvic tumor in women, and they arise from the smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts of a woman's uterus or myometrium, which contracts during labor. Basically, they're benign and they're made of fibrous muscle balls. That's basically how I would describe them. Um, they have a malignant potential or a chance of becoming cancerous. That's really very small. They occur more commonly in black women. They have a two to threefold higher increase risk of having fibroids. And the majority of them are thankfully asymptomatic, which is great. Right? Women have no symptoms whatsoever. If a woman does have symptoms, well, she has typically mostly heavy vaginal bleeding, which is called menorrhagia, which sometimes can result in anemia. She can also have the um, pressure symptoms that leads to pain, pressure, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, urinary retention, fecal retention, cramping, and painful intercourse. It can also lead to infertility problems like um, preterm labor, preterm delivery, frequent miscarriage, and just the inability to get pregnant. So how do we describe fibroids? They're basically described by where they're located. And so intramural ones are located in the muscular wall of the uterus. Then there are subserosal ones that originate from the muscular wall that extend to the outer skin surface. They can create like a an irregular contour to the uterus. I always describe it as looking like Mickey Mouse ears if you were looking at it. And there's also submucosal fibroids that originate from the myometrium or the muscular wall and poke into the intrauterine cavity. I like to think of the submucosal ones as if you put your tongue in your in your cheek and you feel that mucosa of our of our mouth. If you felt a little bump, that'd be like a submucosal myoma. And you can also have cervical ones that are located in the cervix. So how do we, you know, evaluate fibroids and treat fibroids? Well, firstly, just a clinical exam. We just feel the uterus and feel how big it is. We typically relate uterine size to pregnancy. So if your uterus is near your belly button, it's like you're 20 weeks pregnant. So it's a 20 week size uterus. So we can just feel, that's the first part of just feeling how big this uterus is. Secondly, we can do an ultrasound and that could be transvaginal, especially in smaller uteri or transabdominal to measure the size, the location of the fibroids. And then there's also MRI, which Dr. Lippman will get into. So how do we treat fibroids? Well, there's lots of ways to treat fibroids and most of them relate to or, or what the patient wants, what her desires are as a woman, the size of the fibroids. So for example, if you have small fibroids and bleeding is your biggest problem, you could go simply on a hormonal birth control routine, take a birth control pill, um, use the birth control ring, the birth control patch. Another option for a smaller uterus would be an IUD that contain, contains levonorgestrel, one of which is called Mirena, the other is called Liletta. Simply putting that in can decrease the amount of bleeding a woman has each month. Another one is an endometrial ablation where we burn or ablate the uterine lining to help prevent bleeding. However, if the symptoms that bother the woman the most are the bulk pressure-like symptoms, we can do a myomectomy and a myomectomy um, can be done hysteroscopically or through a camera if the fibroid is located in the cavity. It could be done abdominally, robotically, hystero um, sorry, um, laparoscopically, an open procedure just to remove those fibroids if she still wants to keep her uterus, whether because she wants to have children still or just wants to keep her uterus because she doesn't want to let go of it. And those are okay reasons too. Um, another option is a um, embolization which is Dr. What Lippman's gonna talk about in a minute, and then hysterectomy, getting rid of the fibroids with the uterus intact. So I have a couple of pictures, that one of which shows the exam that we perform. There's a laparoscopic view of a fibroid that you can see right here, and you can see this irregular contour because the fibroids are um, subserosal or under the skin surface. That's a laparoscopic view right here. Here's an open view of a hysterectomy I did. It was a very large 24-week size uterus with multiple fibroids. And so she want, we did an open procedure for her. And you can see the uterus right there. Then when you remove the uterus, you can see all the fibroids and the cervix that we did remove. Right here is the hysteroscopic or camera view through the uterine canal. 
and that's a fibroid it's called intracavitary that's right there in the cavity that was easily removed and this is a picture of a myomectomy where I was removing one of the fibroids because she wanted to maintain her fertility and here's a picture of some more fibroids okay Dr. Littman tell me about uterine fibroid embolization that is the procedure that I do not do when it comes to fibroids well, um, that's a lot of information you got in a very short amount of time. That was great. Um, we wanted to be wanted to get this done quickly. <laughs> Keep um, our readers' attention. Tremendous amount of information. That was, yes, it was awesome. Uterine fibroid embolization, or UFE, some people call it uterine artery embolization, UAE. It's the same procedure. It's a completely non-surgical outpatient procedure. Um, it's been performed in this country for the past 25 years. So it has a long track record of safety and efficacy. It works in just about everybody. 90% um, success rates for bleeding, the heavy bleeding uh, and bulk related symptoms. It doesn't matter how big or how many fibroids you have. Um, the procedure we do here in the center is done in my office. The procedure takes me about 30 to 40 minutes. The patients sleep through the procedure, but they're not put to sleep like in a surgical situation. The, the sedation is IV and local, it's very pleasant. Patients sleep through the procedure. Afterwards, there's a brief recovery in our center for about four hours, and then they're discharged home with just a Band-Aid, that's it, uh, at the top of their right leg where we go in. Um, so there's a Band-Aid, and they discharge on medication, um, and the recovery at home is about five or six days. So we tell patients to anticipate being out of work for a week. Um, but a lot of patients go back sooner, uh, particularly a lot of people are with the COVID are working from home. They can work from home after two or three days. Um, and then we see everybody back in the office three months after the procedure. And what we hope to see are two things. One, that the patient says, yeah, my symptoms are dramatically better or gone. And then we look at the MRI imaging to make sure that all the fibroids are dead. Because if those two things are in place, likely I'll never see the patient again. And as they say, that should be the case about nine chances out of 10. That's great. So can you go into a little bit of detail how you actually perform the procedure? The procedure, as I say, is performed under uh, local and IV sedation. And I direct a very tiny catheter the size of a piece of spaghetti under x-ray into each of the uterine arteries separately. Each of the uterine arteries are like trees. They, they have a big trunk, a main trunk, and then they branch and the branches get smaller and smaller. So you get out to the leaves of the tree, the leaves are where the fibroids are located. And I know what size those tiny peripheral branches that feed the fibroids are. And so I can flow direct particles to plug up this blood supply to all the fibroids. That's why it doesn't matter if there's one or 100, all of them should get knocked out. And without a blood supply, these fibroids will start to die off. And as they do, they soften significantly as well as shrink. And so the combination of those two things is what the symptoms go away. The patients will, it takes some time, but over the days to weeks after the procedure, they should notice that their symptoms are significantly improving, if not going away entirely. So when do you do that follow-up MRI to see if the uterus has become smaller? At three months after the procedure, we see everybody back either in the office uh, or by teleconsult over the internet. Okay. Are there certain fibroids that you should not be performing a uterine fibroid embolization for? Well, the simple answer is not is you can perform fibroid embolization pretty much on any of the fibroids, any of the locations that you mentioned, submucosal, subserosal, intramural. Um, cervical fibroids, um, one of the ones you mentioned, are, are unusual. They, those don't respond very well to embolization. So we avoid embolizing cervical fibroids. But um, for the most part, any patient that is a surgical candidate for fibroids is also a candidate for embolization. As they say, there are rare exceptions, like the cervical ones really don't respond very well. Okay, and what about pedunculated ones that are hanging from a stalk? Right, um, pedunculated fibroids can be embolized. Now, it really depends on, I mean, a lot of the fibroids that we see that are labeled pedunculated, in fact, aren't really pedunculated at all. Um, they're exophytic, 
Pedunculated should be reserved for very thin stalks and then a big ball like a lollipop, a thin stalk and then a big ball. But a lot of times it's not that way. The, the connection between the fibroid and the uterus is rather broad. But if you had a very, very, and I'm talking millimeter size stalk and a very big fibroid, you know, eight, nine, 10 centimeters, Okay, maybe you, you would avoid embolizing that, but um, I've embolized quite a few pedunculated fibroids without any issue. The, there, is, there was one case report many years ago which started the you shouldn't do it for pedunculated um, that actually the fibroid detached and they had to remove it uh, laparoscopically. But uh, as they say, there are very few pedunculated fibroids that I would not embolize. So it, it comes up occasionally, but not very often. Okay, you and I are doing um, a combination type procedure for one of our patients. Yep. Um, tell me why we needed to do that and explain that to our viewers. Yeah, that's a great use. I mean, patients are best served when um, physicians work together like we have a collegial relationship and kind of bringing the best skills of surgery as well as interventional radiology together. The combined approach is really elegant because a lot of patients, let's you know, they don't want surgery. And so um, if they can avoid surgery, even if it's two procedures, like in this case, neither one of which involves surgery, the surgery um, from the inside, if you will, is called hysteroscopic removal of a fibroid is what you do. Um, you can place a scope inside the uterus, inside the cavity and remove a fibroid um, sometimes those fibroids get pretty big and it gets bigger than what is safe to remove from the inside, either because this, you know, it just takes a lot of time to remove a living fibroid and you get into this deficit of fluids because you got to keep instilling fluids right. to see where you are. But um, what's so elegant about our procedure is that with the embolization that I do, all the fibroids are dead the ones, no matter where they are, including the one in the cavity. Mm -hmm. And so we go first and embolize all those fibroids, kill them all, and then that fibroid that's sitting in the cavity, before she could pass it out of her or try to pass it, which would be unpleasant, yes. you can take it out. And it's easy to take out because it's dead. It's not a right. living fibroid. So the, the combination is, is a quite an elegant approach. Yes, we have a lovely woman that we're going to be doing that soon for us. So I'm glad we could work together on that. I do have another question. If, say, for example, we have a woman who has a 20-week size uterus, it's up towards her belly button, what should she expect as far as how big it will be to my, my clinical exam, to her and her jeans, her bathing suits, her stretch pants? Mm -hmm. What will it feel like for her? Well, after the embolization, if she were to be embolized, she should expect somewhere in the by three months, we see everybody, as I mentioned, three months after. By that three-month follow-up, the uterine size is about 40 to 50% smaller. Um, and so while that doesn't sound like a lot, the patient, it feels so much better because not only is she getting, you know, a pretty good size reduction, um, it's the fibroids are dead and they're soft. And so it's not this hard, firm rock anymore. Um, and it's so much more pleasant. The bloating symptoms, the clothes fitting tight, the bathing suits tight, the people asking them if they're pregnant when they're not, all of that stuff goes away. So by three months after the procedure, the woman that has that big uterus up to her belly button is now much smaller and no one's asking her about if she's pregnant or not. She feels significantly better. The bloating, the clothes fit tight, all that is gone, should be. The bleeding is much lighter. By the third cycle, her periods are light and regular. She's not gushing or flooding or she's not anemic anymore. She's got energy that she hasn't seen in years, maybe. Um, so she feels great. It's transformational. That's great. Um, another question. So if you want to become pregnant in the future, is UFE okay for you? Well, yes, it is okay, um, but it's a longer discussion. I wouldn't say that if you're interested in fertility, a lot of times patients are told you can't have UFE, the procedure I do. That's not true. That's false. Now, it's a much longer discussion, and we need to see exactly, and that's where MRI is really helpful, and it's a much more 
it's, it has a much higher resolution than the ultrasound, which is the typical first line imaging tool to kind of diagnose fibroids. But for someone like that who's interested in fertility, it's really important to know to much greater detail. And the MRI is like, the resolution is so much better. And, and so you really get to see, because a lot of times patients will say, well, I know I have two fibroids or three fibroids. I've been following them. And we get the MRI and there's 15 or 20 or 30. Now, when you've got so many fibroids in the uterus, I think embolization becomes more, you know, available as an option. If you truly only have one or two small fibroids, you've never had a child, you're young, myomectomy is still the way to go just because we have a lot more data on it. And the, while we've been doing UFE for 25 years, we don't have as much data on fertility patients. But what I can tell you is, I've had numerous children after UFE. I've had four sets of twins, and our births are typically full-term and vaginal, which That's is nice. nice. Patients like vaginal births. Um, they, you know. And so while it's not a panacea by any means, it's certainly in the discussion. you got to see how old is the patient, how many fibroids does she have. If she's ever had a myomectomy, I think those patients all benefit from UFE. There's no reason, I don't think, to do a second myomectomy. No, I won't do that. setting her up for a third procedure. So right. it really depends on if she's ever been operated on, how good of a surgical can is, how many fibroids she has. There, it's a much longer discussion than the typical patient that I see that's not interested in fertility. And it's really between UFE and hysterectomy. That is an easier discussion. It's a quicker. Right, absolutely. Now, what about um, menopause? So women who undergo UFE, do they tend to undergo menopause sooner? Um, well, oh, I, I see. Okay. For patients that undergo UFE, you I can... I think she did so in her 40s. Right. The average age is 52. Could she expect to go through it sooner? I, she, might go to, she might go into menopause sooner. I've never seen anyone in the close to 25 years that I've been doing this and 9,000 UFEs I've never seen anybody under 40 ever go into menopause after UFE. As you get above 40, you start to see some patients, 40 to 45, now you get about 1 to 2%, 46 to 50, maybe up to 10%, 50 and above, now 20, 25%. Mm -hmm. um, so as a woman gets close to her, whatever her true menopausal age is, you'll start to see some patients that go into menopause after UFE. Um, now, what I thought you were going to ask me was, do you ever embolize postmenopausal women? Because most women, mo most women that go into menopause don't have any fibroid issues anymore. So if you can get to menopause without surgery or without UFE, You're great. Right. That's fine. But occasionally, we will, on occasion, embolize postmenopausal, usually they're recently postmenopausal, that are still suffering from urinary frequency typically, and they still have a big fibroid on top of their bladder compressing it like a paperweight. And so they still urinate frequently or they may even leak urine. Um, they're obviously not having bleeding issues anymore, but we'll embolize those patients and those symptoms will resolve. That's great. And then what about your um, typical conversion rate with UFE to a ventral hysterectomy? What percentage of patients would you say do have to go through that? Roughly, well, they'll either... Um, go to hysterectomy because um, they not feel that they didn't get enough of the symptomatic improvement. Sometimes they end up in hysterectomy for other reasons, but um, I, the percentage of patients that go to hysterectomy after embolization is small, mm -hmm. up to a, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Okay. We'll get, we'll get a hysterectomy whether, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but Again, it's a, for the vast majority of people, it's a one and done. And that's right. nice because, say, it's a simple procedure, outpatient, home with a Band-Aid. And importantly, you get to keep your parts because a lot of times I'll hear patients say, well, you know, my doctor told me once I'm, ha I'm done having my children, I really don't need my uterus anymore. The uterus does have a lot of important functions for women besides just bearing them children. And, and if you can keep it, I think it's important to try to do so. Right. It's an interesting conversation with patients. You know, I offer every option 
you know, ones that'll, you know, keep me in business, ones that'll keep you in business. And it's basically just the patient's decision on what she wants to do. And, and there's a lot more people out there. In fact, we call them the silent sufferers. Um, so the pie is, is even bigger than, you know, because there's so many people sitting on the sidelines. Because um, I know that sometimes, in, you know, I've spoken at uh, OBGYN meetings numerous times. You know, sometimes there's the feeling in the room that it's plus one for me and minus one for gynecology. If I do a UFE, right. it's not that way at all. No. The, there is so many more people that we can serve. Uh, in fact, we, we saw that when I, I used to have a practice at Piedmont Hospital many, many years ago. And, and we were doing angioplasty, peripheral angioplasty, and the vascular surgeons were all up in arms back then. Right. And, and, you know, because we were doing, you know, uh, we were doing aortic stent grafts. Um, and so that was their territory as well as peripheral intervention. But I said, you know, let's do this together. And I bet we'll do more than what each of us was doing individually. And that was the case. Um, when we started doing aortic stent grafts together, the vascular surgical volume that they were seeing was tremendous because they could do their opens, but they could now offer the interventional. And that's why I say when you're working together, it, it just grows the pie. It's true. I've never been afraid of losing business for, you know, offering a better option for a woman. So I hope most gynecologists are not doing that. That would I'd be say. great. We'll <laughs> see. So yeah. as far as like, why do you think for women, why do you think they would choose interventional radiology procedures over a hysterectomy in your, in your opinion and what you see in your office? What I see in my office is that women that I see, and again, I mean, I see, you know, obviously people want to keep their uterus. That that is a very important thing for them. It it's the essence of their womanness. It you know, and so they they don't want to lose their they don't want to lose their uterus. And this is a way for them. They may not be interested in children, um, right? But they so, want to keep which, their parts. <laughs> they just want to keep their parts. They came into the you know in this world with their uterus, and they want to leave with their uterus. And I respect that. And um, as I say, there are other functions. You know, the uterus is important. For them psychologically, the epicenter, right. but it's also important sexually. There's some sexual dysfunction that women can, you know, undergo after a hysterectomy. Right. Um, urinary leaking, you know, you, you remove this big fibroid filled uterus and they may have issues with urinary leaking after hysterectomy. We right. know it's important for calcium, you know, bone loss. There's a lot of bone loss after hysterectomy. Um, and Do there's you think that's more of the lack of, I would think that would be more of potential the um, the involvement of collateral circulation to the ovaries versus the removal of the uterus itself. Would you agree with that? Or well, yeah, the, perhaps. I mean, because um, you do see for even in women that they leave the ovaries behind, a number of them still will go into menopause either immediately early. Mm -hmm. or yeah. early. Right. Yeah. I get that. I had one more question. And I forgot what it was. I'll think about it. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to offer? I'm hoping you can show us some MRI pictures um, and even maybe a picture of the procedure. Um, I can get you that information if you want to then show it to your I, audience. I, yeah. Yes, um, yes. I, I don't have a way to show like. No, no, uh, not right now. I'm saying, well, we'll show it to you. I, if you just send it to me, Dr. Yeah. Whitman, I will put it on our PowerPoint. Yeah, we can Bye. show you, picture, you know, very simple pictures of an MRI because, say, MRI is great because you can actually really see things. The untrained eye can see everything very well, whereas an ultrasound, a lot of the patients, you show them an ultrasound, and it's very difficult for the untrained yeah. eye. <laughs> yes, I agree with you very much. Well, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate this. My whole goal is to educate women, and I'm hoping that we did so tonight. And if you have any questions, you can call my office, you can call Dr. Littman's office, and you'll see on our presentation that both of our um, information is on this um, website. Oh, it's great. I really appreciate you having me on, and um, thank you very much. It's great working with you and say, I wish every gynecologist in Atlanta was <laughs> as open and as willing to work together as you were, because it's, it's refreshing and it's wonderful. Well, thanks. I mean, my goal is to take care of the patients out there. So if we can do that together, that's what should happen. Excellent. Okay. Have a great evening, John. Stay safe. You too. <laughs>